Hello and welcome to another installment of Conservation Conversations with BirdLife South Africa. I'm your host, Melissa Howes Whitecross. And before we begin tonight's webinar, I'd like to extend my support and the support of BirdLife South Africa to the millions of people protesting against the institutionalized racism and discrimination against people of color across the United States of America and the world. And we want to say to the millions of people fighting every day against oppression and inequality that we see you. BirdLife South Africa's mission is to encourage people to enjoy and value nature. And that means all people, irrespective of race, color, or creed. Nature should be inclusive, and it should be a space for all to enjoy in a safe and accepting environment. I've invited Andrew de Bloch, our AV Tourism Project Manager, to share a brief message with all of us tonight about the hashtag Black Birders Week campaign that is currently running. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks, Melissa. Uh, so for those of you that, that follow us on Facebook, you, you may already know that um, this week has been declared Black Birders Week. Um, for those of you who do not have Facebook or have not seen that uh, message just yet, uh, we thought it was worth uh, going into just before Ernst gets stuck into his talk and bringing that message to you. This was an init initiative that began in the USA, but has very fast become a global movement. So around a week ago, uh, a man called Christian Cooper, a lifelong birder, was birding in Central Park. Uh, that's him on your, the left-hand side of your screen. He saw a lady walking her dog off its leash and it was running amok in the flower beds. Um, he approached the dog owner and asked her to leash the dog. Uh, she then panicked and threatened to call the police and tell them that an African-American man was threatening her life. That's a direct quote. He chose to let her call the police and film this conversation. The video of this event has since gone viral and unfortunately is just one in a string of recent race incidents, racist incidents in the USA, including the death of George Floyd that has now sparked nearly a week of, of uh, protest in the USA. Um, those protests are now eclipsing coronavirus in the news, which tells you a lot about the magnitude of the situation. So birders have chosen to show solidarity with Christian Cooper and birders of color and declare this Black Birders Week. This week is a, there is a focus on uplifting birds of color and demonstrating that nature loving communities are inclusive rather than exclusive. Uh, Bird Life South Africa has joined this initiative and we feel very strongly about the core message of inclusivity. Um, we have a, an organizational goal of changing our membership demographic and of helping the bird clubs and the birding communities at large do this and open up access to new communities. Um, so that we can better reflect the demographics of South Africa. We have also just entered level three uh, with the last briefing from the Minister of Tourism indicating that self-drive in province visits to nature reserves and parks will be allowed and so will nature guiding. So we, we're quite cautiously optimistic that the, the finer details of these announcements will be worked out pending a court order that I've just seen um, almost live news come in. So we're following that very closely. Uh, but our community guides um, are hoping to start basing in their guiding work again. Many of you will know that they've come on some hard times during the uh, lockdown um, and that we have been supporting them through our community bird guide relief fund. So thank you very much to all of you who are watching and have contributed to that. Um, if you would like to know more, we do have a page on our website about that relief fund. But for the first day of Black Birders Week yesterday, we chose to highlight our guides and the amazing service that they provide um, to our birding communities and to appeal to our networks to support them. So these are some of our best birders of color in the country and, and they need our help. So please do head to our website under the Go Birding tab. There is a list of the community guides, the areas they work in, their contact details. So please take the opportunity this week to acknowledge birders of color and to help make Birding the inclusive community that it should be. Um, and these guides are at the forefront of our minds right now. So the reason that there is a white face telling you the story, um, I am the AV Tourism Project Manager as of last month, a month in the position. Um, so I, I don't manage the guides, but I interact with them and help them with marketing their services and supporting them um, through our AV Tourism Project. So that's why I'm bringing you this message um, for those who are wondering about the irony of a, a white face presenting this. 
So thank you for supporting the guides during the, the pandemic with the relief fund. Um, if it is now legal for them to work, we are watching the regulations very closely. Please do support them. Uh, they provide an amazing service and are amazing people and you will not be disappointed. We can guarantee that. Thanks, Melissa. Thanks so much, Andrew. On to tonight's webinar. Those of you who are joining us for the first time, just some quick Zoom 101. You can either get in touch with us through the chat room or you can ask your questions in the Q&A box. Please type your questions throughout the webinar. You, Ernst will be on hand to answer some of them with text, but we'll also answer some of them live at the end of the webinar. Um, and I'll pitch those questions to him. And we also very luckily have Sandra on hand as well to try and answer some of those questions too. Now, I'd like to say a big thank you to all of you who have generously contributed to the production of these webinars, particularly last week. You can see the QR code and the website, website donations tab on the screen at the moment. Every donation, no matter how big or small, allows us to cover the costs of producing these webinars each week and bringing, to, bringing them to you for free. Your support is greatly appreciated. Please remember that there's a quick survey at the end of your webinar. It only takes three minutes and it does help us to continue shaping these future webinars and bringing you the content that you'd like to see. Your feedback is very important to us and we really do appreciate your input. I'd like to also remind everyone that BirdLife South Africa is running several competitions at the moment, including the Jackpot Birding Raffle, where you could stand a chance to win a 100,000 Rand cash prize. Tickets are only 500 Rand each, and I know that we could all do with this cash bonus during these tough times. So please head on over to our website to find out more. I'd also like to introduce to all of you a new and exciting collaboration, which we will be, be running for the remainder of the year with Jakarta Media. You'll, you'll be able to stand a chance to win a monthly book giveaway of some of these incredible natural history titles, including the Roberts Field Guide to Birds of Southern Africa, Featherings by BirdLife South Africa board member Vernon Head, and Beat About the Bush by Trevor Carnaby. Unfortunately, this competition is only for our South African-based subscribers, but to enter, you can visit our website, the Conservation Conversations website, and click the link under the competition section. Now tonight, I'd like to welcome one of BirdLife South Africa's long-serving staff members who spent the past decade driving the conservation of South Africa's grasslands and their unique species, including one of my absolute favorites, the secretary bird. Ernst is a ferocious competitor in our annual Bird, La bird Lasso Staff Challenge, and before lo lockdown put a pause on his 2020 plans, Ernst had managed to tickle 427 different species in South Africa at the end of March this year. Despite being a very talented bird watcher and dedicated atlaser, which I'm sure he'll tell you about in a moment, Ernst Ritif is a passionate data analyst and has been able to merge his love of birds and bird watching with his masterful abilities to crunch these data into meaningful conservation tools and guidelines to protect our most threatened species and habitats. Ernst, I'd like to welcome you to Conservation Conversations. And while you briefly greet everybody, I'm going to load up your presentation. Thanks, Melissa. I will have to get back to you on that um, fiercely competitive uh, birding <laughs> one. But <laughs> thanks for that. Yes, everybody, welcome. I decided to record my meeting tonight. Um, first of all, I need to jump between PowerPoint and the live demonstration of the website. And I don't like doing live internet presentations um, or do pre internet presentations live. So um, I've recorded um, the meeting. You're more than welcome to answer or ask questions in the Q&A panel and myself and Shanjo will um, try and answer the questions. So please sit back and enjoy the presentation. Thank you very much, Ernst. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this webinar about the South African Birth at this project. I hope through the next 45 minutes or so, to tell you a little bit more about the Southern African Bird Atlas project background, um, how we use the data, Bird Class of Africa and other places, and also then to show you how you can access some of the data on the Sabah 2 website. As the title of my talk says, it's really a treasure trove of information. There's absolutely fantastic um, information about species distribution, you can create your own species checklists, um, all on the website. It's all for free and open source. And I hope to show you tonight um, how you can do uh, that and how you can create your own list. So sit back 
and enjoy um, this journey through this wonderful project we called um, SABAC2. But first of all, uh, a talk about data and so on can be visually not so great. So um, I've added lots of bird photographs um, and I just want to give a shout out to Albert Furnemann uh, who shared on a regular basis, shares photos with BirdLife of Africa staff and we can use the, the photos um, as we wish. So thanks Albert and Mariki for your support of BirdLife of Africa and please visit the website www.wildlifephotography.co.za for more information about the workshops and the work that they do. So let me begin by saying that I really, really like the concept of citizen science. Now there are very formal definitions of the, the term citizen science, but in very simple terms, it means that we as birders can go out and do what we like to, like to do most, best or most, and that is go and do some birding. But by just adhering to a very simple scientific protocol, we can add value to our data and submit that data to a central database and that data can then use, be used by academics, NGOs, government, etc., to help with the conservation of birds. So we know that we live in a really large country, we've got over 850 bird species. It would just be plain impossible for um, professionals like, like government ornithologists to collect all this data in South Africa. It is just not possible. But making use of all the birders using their data, we can actually build fantastic distribution maps for South Africa. And to me, that is such a really nice concept um, that we can use ordinary citizens to collect um, scientific data. So we are lucky in South Africa to have numerous citizen science projects. There are more bird related projects, um, coordinated water bird counts, it's counting water birds. We've got the South African Bird Ringing Unit. These are, again, ordinary citizens that go out and catch birds, put rings on their legs so that they can uniquely identify them. And also then submit this data to the SAFRING database. Then there are the various virtual museums where people can submit data about frogs and about butterflies and um, all sort of other animals and taxa. Um, it's just, again, a way that people can submit their data um, through the virtual museums. And naturally then there's SABAC2, the Southern African Bird Atlas Project, we will, which we will talk about today. Let's talk then about SABAC2. SABAC2 is really a project that um, started um, in 2007. So it's been ongoing for about 13 years. And the main purpose of the project is to map the distribution of birds across several Southern African countries. What's important to understand here that SABAP2 is just a sub project of bird map. So bird map covers the whole of Africa. So the same protocol that we follow here in South Africa for the Atlas project, a few years ago, this was expanded to the whole of Africa. So wherever you travel in Africa, you can actually submit data to uh, bird map. Um, using the same protocol that we're using for SABAC2. Um, and as I said, the main purpose is then to map the distribution of birds. Um, and, but then also, because this is a long-term monitoring project, to monitor changes of bird distribution over time. And this is really important due to climate change, the way that um, the, the landscape is changing, bird distributions are changing, and it's important for us to keep track of these changes. Let me talk quickly about the management of the project. And I really want to say thank you today to everybody that helps and support the project. So the project is managed by a steering committee and the Peter Ryan was the, the chair of the, um, the committee. And then they are representatives of the various partners of this project. And I need to acknowledge here Sandby, um, South African National Biodiversity Institute. They provide the funding for this project the Fitzpatrick Institute of African Ornithology, who um, host the data, and um, Michael Brooks and Sandra Rose and works for the FITS, 
and they basically manage um, and, and host the data for us. And um, then Birdlife South Africa is a key partner um, in the project. And then also Birdlife, um, I think you all know about the app Birdlife, and a lot of our data these days are submitted um, to the project through Birdlife. Then the day to day running of the project is managed by myself, but I really have got a small role to play. Um, Sandra Rose um, plays a massive role in project communications, but much more than that. Um, she answers queries, she, um, she does so much to, to help uh, manage this project, and I really want to thank Sandra. But I think today we must really say thank you to Michael Brooks as we're going to talk a lot about the website. Michael is responsible for the whole design of the SAVAP2 website and he's, uh, he's absolutely key um, to the success of the SAVAP2 project. So thank you, Michael. We appreciate all your hard work. Then we also have regional atlas committees. So as I explained later, all data submitted to the project um, go through a vetting process. And the regional atlas committees are the people who um, vet our data and um, all of them are volunteers. They've all got jobs, but they do this after hours, over weekends. And we recently, myself and Chandra, met with all of them. And I just realized again how crucial they are um, to the management um, of this whole project. So thanks to them. And then there's also the Virtus African National Realities Committee. Melissa is hosting this meeting tonight, um, is managing that for us. And then Trevor Hardick is the chairperson, and they've got a massive role to play in vetting um, the national rarities that are submitted to SABAC2. So also thank you to them for their contribution and help. And then lastly, I must thank the Atlases. So over 2,000 people Atlases have submitted data to this project since 2007. And without them, this project would, they, they, they would not be a project. They have spent literally millions and millions of rands in the last 13 years in fuel, in food, in equipment, um, in data. I mean, it is, they, they've really spent a lot of um, their own money to collect this data and to submit it to the project. So thank you to each and every Atlas uh, um, for your contribution. If you want more information about the project, um, there is the SOAP2 website, but I'll talk to you about that a little bit later, more about that. If you have email queries, you can just use the email address sabap2 at birdlife.org.za and you can also just search on Facebook. Um, we've got a group and a page um, for the project where we share information about the project. One, if you want to learn more project, about the project, I want to ask that you visit our website and that you um, visit the resources tab on the website. So today's talk, it's not a talk or a workshop on how to submit data to the project. We had many of these workshops in the past and maybe we can have one uh, webinar like this in the future. But actually myself and Hank Nell, the two uh, webinars in the past, the first one is how to set up and use with the Birdlass app. That's the first link there on the, pa on the page. And the last one is how to submit an Atlas card using the Bird Atlas app. So those were about 30, 40 minutes videos, two of them. And in that, we show you how to set up the app, the Birdlasser app, and then um, at the rec and to record your sightings. And the last and the other one is how to submit your data. So really, with, by watching those two webinars, you will get all the information you need in order to submit data to this project. So please go to the Server 2 website, click on resources, and then um, you'll find the link there, videos about how to submit your data to the project. So let's quickly talk about data submission and quality. Now, as I mentioned, Birdclass is a really key partner in the SABAP2 project. Over 90% of the data now are submitted to the project through Birdclass. I sometimes think back in the first workshops I did um, 13 years ago, when we had these large, large um, one to 50,000 topographical maps and we had to have our little clocks running and it was really complicated to determine where you are in a pen pad, when you're in and out to keep time. But then Hink Nell came and he developed Birdlaster and the world protocol is basically built in the app. 
So in the left-hand side, you can see there's a um, pen pad boundary, and I'll explain more about it a bit later, where I flock the birds, um, the time, everything is kept um, by the app. You could just take your binoculars, take your app, um, drive to the pen pad, start atlasing, do it um, for the two or three hours as required by the protocol, and then use the app to submit your data. It is really, really as easy as that. Currently, more than 18 million records have been submitted to the project. So that is a massive database, 18 million records by more than 2,000 atlases. But it's really important to understand that all the data are vetted. When a person submits the data, the data are checked against the current database. And this is quite a long process and it's quite complicated. I'm not going into that now in detail. But what it means that the data in the database are accurate. Yes, there might be an error here and there. And we've now actually started the second vetting process to sort out some of those issues. But I can promise you that 99.5% or even more of the data in the database are absolutely 100% correct. Um, on the right hand side, side, for those that don't know, that is an out of range form. Now that is going to change now, but it gives you an idea. This is a record for a white brow sparrow beaver I saw in Kruger. So you can see it is quite far out of range of its normal distribution. But I now need to submit this form with the information um, required to the vetting committee in Mukumalanga, the bank in McKenzie, and hopefully they will accept this record and they will click on that green button there that says accept this record, or if they're not happy, they will reject this record. But this is just to show that um, there is a vetting process in the background and that helps us to ensure that the data in the database are, act um, are accurate. What are the value of sub 2 data? And I'm sure Melissa and me will really enjoy ourselves, will enjoy this photograph. We both love secretary birds. So the first thing is why do we need bird marine projects? And it's actually quite simple. Um, in order to conserve birds, you need to know where they reside. I mean, that is the first thing, the first step in any conservation project. If you want to conserve, let's say, secretary birds, um, you need to know where they are. You can't go and spend a 500,000 rand or a million rand on a habitat restoration project, for, for example, for security birds, if you don't know where they are. In, so it is really crucial for, as a first step to know where birds are before you can start a conservation project. And in our country, we've got over 850 bird species, over 130 of them are threatened. And we need to know where each of them are, what is, what's the distribution like before we can start um, conservation projects. But it's also important that we prioritize our work. We, we cannot, we don't have enough resources to, to conserve every little habitat in South Africa. So we maybe want to determine where in the country are these 10 or 20 or 30 threatened bird species together so that we, we can focus our conservation efforts there. By having clear this sort of re, um, great detailed distribution maps help us to prioritize our work. It also helps us to work effectively and efficiently, as I said, so that the money that we spend are used effectively and efficiently. But we also want feedback. If we as conservation organizations do work, um, we need to have some feedback to see whether our conservation work actually has an impact. Um, so this whole system theory thing of doing stuff and uh, doing work, you get certain outputs and then you need to measure your output and uh, determine whether you're actually achieving what you set out to do. And SABAP2 is an excellent tool to help us to, to do this long-term monitoring that we need to do in order to determine whether our conservation work is actually um, working. But I want to make the point that bird monitoring does not equal bird conservation. And that might strange, sound strange to you, considering that I absolutely love this project. But yes, it is true that by monitoring birds and mapping them, we're actually not conserving anything as yet. We haven't um, minimized the threat to a species, eliminated poisoning or habitat destruction or anything like that. So it is really important that the data that we collect must also be analyzed and be analyzed in such a way that we as conservation NGOs can use that data in order 
to um, conserve birds. And that is an important role that academics can play, for instance, is to analyze the data, but we as NGOs and government can then use that data and that analysis in order and then implement conservation actions based on this. So the bird monitoring aspect is the first step in any conservation project, but not, um, it, it doesn't equal bird conservation. One of the ways that we use the Savatru data at Bird Loss of Africa is through the publication of our important bird and biodiversity areas directory in 2015. Um, and then also there's now a new um, standard called key biodiversity areas. And um, in both projects, we use Savatru data extensively to decide which are these important areas in the country for the conservation of birds. So whenever we meet with professionals, with ornithologists, with academics, we always look at the SABAP2 data and say, look, are there threatened bird species here? How many are there? Are they just vagrants here? Or is it the core area of the species? We use all of this sort of data in order to determine which are the most important areas in the country for the conservation of birds. One of the things that we also can do for, through this project is to monitor changes in bird distribution. The nice thing about this project, and I haven't talked about it this yet, that we, before SABAP 2, we had SABAP 1 in the 1990s. Um, so there was a, quite a long period between the time that SABAP 1 ended and when SABAP 2 started. And by comparing the two projects, we can actually monitor or detect changes in bird distribution. So in the case of common minor, the orange areas and the yellow area, uh, the orange areas where the species occurred, um, yeah, sorry, the orange and yellow areas where the species occurred in SABAP 1, and the pinkish area is where the species were recorded in SABAP 2, but it were not recorded in SABAP 1. So you can actually see the changes in distribution um, of the species, how the range have expanded um, in South Africa. So it's, it's a really nice and clear example of how we can use the data um, to see changes in species distribution. The other value of the project is that we can use the data to inform our bird apps and also our field guides. And recently, Robert's Multimedia, the new version came out, made extensive use of SABAP2 data. The Bird Pro app, um, Herman van den Berg used um, SABAP2 data exclusively, basically exclusively to, to develop the maps for the Bird Pro app. And even the Robert Field Guide um, used the same maps as in Robert's Multimedia. But again, it's a field guide that uses SABAP2 data um, for, for the distribution maps. As I said earlier, it's really important for us that the SABAP2 data must be um, analyzed and published. And on the SABAP2 website, under that resources tab I showed you earlier, you can actually get the list of all the academic papers that have been published using SABAP1 and SABAP2 data. So you can see, for instance, there's a number of publications published in 2019, and already one in 2020, and just recently um, another one was published, which will be uploaded soon, I'm quite soon. So will be uploaded quite soon. You are also welcome to go to that resources tab, click on that links, and in most cases you'll be able to read the article. One of the big uses of the data is for our Red Data Book of Birds. A few years ago, Martin Taylor, Fancy Peacock and Ross Wanders um, um, published the 2015 ESCOM Red Data Book um, of Birds for South Africa, Sutu and Swaziland. And the Red Data Book is really, really crucial to the conservation sector for it guides our conservation efforts. And if you open this book, you will see that it made extensive use of SABAP2 data. The maps, for instance, developed by Fancy Peacock was basically based on SABAP2 maps. Even in the text, for example, it says there for what the year in this case, SABAP2 data indicate a 3 8% decrease in AOs than SABAP1, etc. So SABAP2 data was used extensively to determine the red data status of birds in South Africa. The one thing that we're really excited about is a new set of distribution maps we will develop that will feed into the various conservation planning tools that we have in South Africa. Now this is a world talk on its own. I'm not going to discuss this in detail, 
But just to say that we have an excellent environmental legal framework in South Africa, lots of legislation that manage um, how the environment should be managed. And one of the crucial building blocks of all of these plans and uh, frameworks are CBA maps. I've got a little um, blue arrow showing there. And a CBA map is a critical biodiversity area map, basically indicate the areas that are the most important for the conservation of all taxa, not only birds. Um, it's biodiversity area map, so it, it covers all taxa. But we have a problem that in the past, birds didn't really feature in these maps and they couldn't use SABAP2 data to do that. And the main reason for that was that to order to, to make these CBA maps, they use, the, they need really fine scale data and they prefer sort of point data. But we know for birds, that's really, really difficult. And birds move around and therefore it's important that we show the total distribution and feed that into CBA maps. But as I said, the Pentad is quite coarse. It's about 50 to 60, even a little bit more square kilometers. And if this is now the, the, the maps that you see these for um, orange ground thrush, and those two red blocks indicate the pen, two Pentads where the species were seen. But you can see there are plantations in the Pentad, there are wetlands, there's grasslands. And we know that orange ground thrush is a forest-based species. It will not occur in those sort of habitats. So we want to identify the suitable habitat within those pentads and then submit those layers to conservation planners. Now to do that by hand um, will take years and years, but we these days have really um, nice um, computer models that we can build and the computers then can basically identify these, uh, for instance, indig indig indigenous forests for us. And we can plot it on a map and then we can create layers, spatial layers, that we can feed to conservation planners. So this is a project that myself and Robin Poulain at BirdLife is working on, and we are now creating these species distribution models overlaid for SAVAP2 data and create these fine scale maps that will feed into conservation planning tools in South Africa. But I would also like to ask you as the general public, to please use the data. The data are open source and can be used by anyone. It really is, it is freely available. You don't need to pay anything to use the data. As I'll show you later on, you can go now, download the data and use it. Yes, for commercial purposes, we want you to maybe contact us and ask, but in general, we, if it's for an environmental impact assessment or so, we agree that you can use the data. But if you use the data, for instance, for the publication of an app or a book, maybe just make contact with us and, and talk about the data. Um, to manage a project like this, that costs a lot of money. And if we can recover some of the cost, that would be good. The only requirement that we have is that whenever you use this data in a publication or a newsletter, please reference SABAP2 and also indicate what date um, you downloaded the data. I have dreamt about how we can use this data in, in so many other ways. Um, so I will explain to you later on how you can use it for general birding purposes, for example, to create a checklist. But just think about what we can do with this data in school projects to teach children about mapping, um, basic um, arithmetic about um, calculating reporting rates, um, doing basic analysis, changes in distribution. It feels to me there must be some basic science projects um, hidden in all this data um, that we can use. And so if there's teachers listening today, please, you know, just go and look at the website, look at the data and think how we can make school projects from this um, and how we can feed this in your curriculum and, and teach children and get them excited about birds and mapping and analysis of data. Hopefully through that we can create um, new and young scientists that's really interested in birds and their conservation and science in general. Before I continue to um, the website, um, there's a few basic efforts in composite that you need to understand in order to understand or to, to interpret and to use the data that's available on the SABAP2 website. So I'm just going to ask you to bear with me for a while. It's also quite interesting to see but you know, these concepts. But as I say, it's really important that you understand them to get full value out of the server 2 website.
The first thing is the cyber two protocols. In very, very broad terms, there are two sort of protocols that you can follow in the cyber two project. The one is the full protocol, Atlas SCART protocol, and the other one is an ad hoc protocol. So the full protocol basically says that Atlas must go into a pen pad, and I'll explain now what that is, and bird actively for at least two hours in an Atlas block. He must record all the birds that he sees or he or she sees in a the order that they have seen the birds and also record how many species they've seen in each hour. But what's the crucial thing here is that the, the Atlas card must be at least two hours long and a maximum of five days. So we want to know that the Atlas have spent a certain amount of effort to create a decent species list for the Pentad. What we also ask is that they cover as much as possible of the Pentad and also as many as possible of the different habitats. So you all know that if you participate in birding big day or you want to create a really extensive species list, that you must try and visit as many habitats because birds are linked to certain habitats, for instance, water, agricultural land, grass and trees. Um, you need to visit all of them in order to get a really extensive species list. And therefore, we are asking Atlas to visit as many as possible of the habitats in the Penta so that we can get a, a, a real, uh, you know, accurate list of the species um, that's in that Penta on that day. And that is a full protocol Atlas card. And ad hoc card is one where Atlas might only have driven very quickly through the Penta and locked a few birds. He might not have visited all the habitats. So basically, he couldn't comply with all the requirements of a full protocol at this card. He could then just submit that data as an ad hoc protocol card. The data is still of value, but we cannot analyze it as extensively as a full protocol at this card. As I said, what's really nice is that all of this is built into the sub 2 protocol. So you can see on the right-hand um, image there, it's a list that I did in the Waterberg. So the first bird I locked is a purple roller, it indicated the time at 1632. Um, the second bird was a laughing there, forked at longer, one swallow. And each time it records the, the date and the time, and then can calculate when I submit the date, how many species I've seen in the first hour, second hour. Um, it will even track when I move in and out of the pentad, start a new list in a new pentad. This is what makes it so great to use the, the, the Birdlass app for it basically keep track of the protocol and help you to concentrate on birding and identifying the species and that does all the, the rest of the work. So I've now mentioned the word Pentad a few. So in order to tell the computers in or the database in Cape Town where you've been atlasing, we, you need to tell it in which atlas block you've atlas. We call this Atlas block a pentad because a pentad is five minute by five minute grid. And as I said, now with the app, it's not really to worry too much about what are five minutes by five minutes. But it's an area, in this case, I've used Kakuza as an example, about 8.34 kilometers by 9.23 kilometers. But it differs, the, the size of the pentad is different country. Um, for reasons that we don't have to discuss now. Just to give you an idea, in other words, how big a pen that is, all of you uh, most probably visit Kukuza. So in this case, Kukuza is in the left bottom corner. You can see the S79 road. We love to travel when we're there. This is Kukuza Airport, the Marula Loop. So it's quite a big area. Um, as I said, it's more than 60 square kilometers in this case. So it's, it is quite, quite a large area. And that is the Atlas unit that's used. We also give this pentad a name, which is linked to the um, coordinates of the top left-hand corner of the pentad. And as I said, in the old days, you had to work out that board. One of the challenges was to work out the name of that um, pentad by, by looking at the coordinates. Um, now the app does it for you, so you don't have to worry about that. But when you submit your data, you will tell the database in Cape Town that I'm submitting data now for Penta 2455 and it's called 3135. And it will immediately know where you um, saw these birds or which area you're going to submit your list. And it can then place it um, or do, when they create maps, they can place it on the, on, uh, the right place. 
Right, so this might sound a little bit strange that I'm talking about reporting rate, but one of the really, really nice functions of the sub two website is the fact that you can sort species according to reporting rate. Now, this might be old news now for a lot of people, but just for those that don't know what is reporting rate. As birders, we all know that if you visit an area, there are certain species that are really common that you will immediately see, or every time you will visit that area, you will see that species. But at other times, there will be other species that you would be really lucky to see, and you know that they might not always be there. So let's use this Kukuza pin that we just had a look. And I think if you're there, you'll agree that there would be a really, really good chance that you'll see a dark hyper wall when you visit that whole area that we've just explained, that whole 60, 70 square kilometer area, there would be a really, really good chance that you'll see a dark at Google. But you will be very lucky to see a little sparrow. We know there might only be two or three pairs of little sparrows in that whole area, maybe only one pair. So the chance that you will see it is actually quite small, unless you know where its nest site is or, um, but even then there might be a chance that they might be foraging somewhere and that you might not see them. In theory, if hundred atlases would submit an atlas cast to the Skukuza paint that we think that most of those hundred atlases or those um, cards would have dark cat bulbul on. There are lots of them, they are always there, so there's a really good chance that an atlas would lock them. However, very few of those hundred atlases will see or record a little sparrow wolf, for there are only a few birds and they much less than dark cat bulbuls. So we can basically use this to work out the reporting rate. So if we look at the table, so we've 100 atlas cards. So let's say of those 100 um, atlas cards had dark cat bulbul on them, we can divide 90 by 100 into 100, and we get that the reporting rate is 90%. But let's say only 10 atlases or 10 cards were submitted for the little sparrowhawk, then the reporting rate would be only 10%. So in general, we can say that species with higher reporting rates are more common in a pentad, and species with lower reporting rates are less common. So we can use reporting rates as a way um, how common or uncommon species is in a pentad. Now, it's important, this is a general rule, and there are lots of exceptions, but I don't want to discuss that now in detail. So just beware. Um, we need to be careful. For instance, migratory bird species are not here in winter, so they generally have lower um, reporting rates. Species that are difficult to see, like white wing fluff tails or fluff tails in general, birds that is only active at night, they will always have a little bit lower reporting rate than what the general numbers in the pen tab might be. So be careful how you analyze that, but in general, it, um, it, it does give you an idea of how common a bird species is in a pen tag. What I would like to do now is to demonstrate some of the features of the Salvap2 website. The first of these is the species distribution maps. Just to quickly explain to you what the page is all about and then I will give you a live demonstration. So on each page you will see a distribution map of the species. So this is a distribution map for the woodland kingfisher. But also on these pages, you will see these graphs as at the bottom. And I need to quickly explain this and it's very interesting and very valuable. The base, using the same concept of reporting rates that we discussed earlier, you can also use this concept for migratory bird species. So in January, February, Woodland kingfishers are quite common in the distribution range. And we see that they, during that period of time, have a reporting rate of between 40 and 50%. But as they start leaving our country, they, they don't do so all at once. And as they do, less and less birders record the birds and their reporting rate drops. So in winter, the reporting rate is zero. And then when summer starts, they, and they start returning to South Africa, their reporting rate increases um, up to the point where it's back to 40, 50% in November, December. So for all migratory bird species, you'll be able to see these graphs and be able to see when they return and leave our borders. And we can also, by comparing this data from year to year, um, see changes in the 
migratory pattern on of birds, which is really valuable, especially considering the impact that climate change might have on migration of patterns of birds. So if you ever want to know when you can expect the first woodland kingfisher in South Africa, you can use these maps to see when they should arrive, or if you begin to wonder when they will leave our shores, you can also use this graph um, to determine that. Now the first thing you need to do is to get to this have to website, and the easiest thing is just to open your favorite browser. In my case, I open my great friend Google. You just type in SABAP2, press enter, and the first link that you should get um, should be um, the SABAP2, the, the link to the SABAP2 website or the BirdMap website. So you just click on that, and there you have your SABAP2 um, website. Well, you'll see there's a login option here. Um, we're not going to worry about that for now. For the species maps and some of the other functions, I will explain there's no need to log in. But for the final tool that I'm going to show you, um, you'll have to log in, but I'll explain that later on. In order to get to the species maps, you just follow the links and you go to species. Um, very simple, click on the species menu item and it will upload a whole list of species. Now, as I explained earlier, SABAP2 is part of bird map. So the species list that you get here is contains species of the wall of Africa. So let's say we want to get our map of the woodland kingfisher. We don't want to scroll through the whole list. So you just click in the search function and type in kingfisher. You can type in any search function, but I found um, typing in the family name works quite well. And you say go and very quickly it created a list of all the birds with kingfisher in their name. So this is alphabetical, so you can just scroll down and there's Woodland Kingfisher and you can just click on it and it will open a page of Woodland Kingfisher, the map for Woodland Kingfisher. So you just have to give it some time. Um, sometimes um, you must understand there's 18 million records for this database to work through and also to render the map um, take a bit of time. So this is what the map looked like. I'm not going to go into too much detail to it, just to show, say that you can use this plus and minus signs to zoom in and out of the map. You can also create use this toggle full screen view on the top if you want to get the full screen view of the map and you can then zoom in and even see more, more detail wherever you want to. If you want to go back to normal view, you just click on that little full screen on the top right and it will return to this map. If you place your cursor over a pen tag, it actually on the right hand show, shows you the pen tag name, the reporting rate for all full protocol cards, how many ad hoc protocol records there is, how many incidental and in, uh, additional information data. So you can actually see some interesting data. And also when you remove your cursor, the legend shows you the reporting rate for the species um, as in the map. So you can actually get a, a really good idea of where the species is really common. So if we, for instance, zoom into the, the Joburg area, so we know that the stronghold for uh, woodland kingfisher is in the northern part of the country and not so much in Johannesburg. And therefore you can see that they got a very low reporting rate um, in Johannesburg. You can click here on the right on simple map and that will just create a map with one color. And so you can see just it, it, um, it doesn't show the legend is actually now not, not true here. Um, it is just um, one color map. And if you want the graded map again, you just click on graded map here on the right and it will change it to the different colors. So if you scroll down, you get to the um, reporting rate map that I just explained now. And as you put your cursor on it, you can for each week see what the species, the average reporting rate for the species for all the years were um, for the species. And you can see as they leave the country, the reporting rates goes lower and lower as less and less birders see the bird. And then in winter, the reporting rate is basically zero. 
and then in um, summer the reporting rate goes up and up and up um, and that is then November, December. I'm not going to discuss sequencing index, that is quite a complicated statistical thing. You can click here on the link here at the bottom and that will take you to um, an explanation of reporting rate and sequence index. The other thing that I'll demo to you is that we can build checklists. Um, so you can build a checklist for just one pen tag or you can build a checklist for a number of pen tags. So in this case, that area in the middle is Pilansburg Nature Reserve. So you can build a, a checklist just for the one pen tag or you'll be able to combine a number of the pen tags and then create a list um, for the world of Pilansburg. And I will also demonstrate to you how you can do that. How do you create a checklist for a specific pen tag? So in this case, you click on coverage. Now that doesn't seem right, but you basically use the coverage map to get a species list for a specific pen tag. So if you get coverage, there's lots of um, areas, geographic areas here. We're interested in South Africa. And let's use the example of Pilansburg that I talked about earlier. So let's go to um, Pilansburg is in the Northwest province. So you just click on that and it will open a map of the Northwest province. And now this might actually take quite a while, um, especially if you're going to select the uh, world of South Africa as the distribution map, it might take quite a while for the data to upload. So, so just please be patient. There are lots and lots of reports to work through and um, it will take quite a while um, for the map to, to, to download. So while the data is uploading, you can see the province name here at the top. Again, here's a legend um, and there's a, there's a bit of a different um, scheme here. And then there's all sorts of tabs of interesting information at the bottom. So there you can see it loaded the distribute of the coverage map for the project for the Northwest province. So the legend on the right shows the number of cards that have been submitted for each pen tag. So cards, pen tags which are in yellow. It's in this case, all these pen tags have only one card, but these pen tags with yellow are in blue, it's about 11 to 24 cards. So these are areas that don't have a lot of atlases. So not a lot of people have visited them, but these are here, Johannesburg and Victoria. We've got lots of atlases. We've got Anthony Archer here in Clapsdorf was making and lots of other atlases was contributing data to that specific area. All right, so let's say we want to go to Pilansburg. So we just zoom into the Pilansburg area. You can see the Pilansburg is in the map here in the background. So let's say we want a pen tag list for that specific pen tag there. And all you need to do is just double click and it will open. You can uh, open the Penta data in a new tab. So there you have your um, map for where you've seen the Pentads. You can actually scroll in if you want to. And the most important information is then at the bottom. So you can actually see how many cars have been submitted for each year for each Pentad, um, total number of species seen in a Pentad in each year and also total number of species seen in the state um, through all the years. So in this pen that 344 bird species have been recorded during all time. But the thing that we really want to look at is this species list. So you click on species list and it brings up a list of all the species which have been seen during the project's lifetime. Currently um, the birds are the, the list is in alphabetic order according to the common group name, the, the family name. So Palis, Furs, Barbet, etc. And what we get here is also the scientific name. And then this is the column that I'm really interested in, is the full protocol reporting rate for the species. Now, all of these columns, if you click on them, you can change the sort order. So if I click on common group, it should change the alphabetical order of the species. So now Reinick is not first, as is first. You click on it again, it will change and the palest will be first again. Now you can do the same with reporting rates and this is what we discussed earlier. So if we can sort the list, 
that the species with the highest reporting rate is at the top, that will give us a fairly good idea of which are the most common species within the pentad. So if you click it on once, you will see this, the lowest reporting rate species are at the top, so click on it again, and you can see the species with the highest reporting rate is now at the top. And as expected, things like dark cat, global pied, kingfisher, black spur, flapwing, Egyptian goose, reed cormorant, are really the species that you can expect to see in that pentad um, within the area. So pied kingfisher, because there's a dam, there's some water birds there, so you can expect um, that they will have a, a quite high reporting rate in the pentad. And as you go down, you'll see the reporting rate goes down and down and down. The very low reporting rate. And some of these species, you, you know, Jaco and Cuckoo, um, will have really low reporting rates within um, that specific pentad. And this is how easy it is to create a species list for a specific pentad. All right, but that is, let's now try and make a list for a species or a number of pentads. Now, in order to do this, you need to log in. In order to log in, you need to have a login name and uh, observer number and a password. And to do that, just click on the register button and register for the project and you will receive an email with the necessary details to log into the website. So I'm already registered, so I'm just going to quickly log in. And you'll see it looks exactly the same, but there is now where I places where I can view my data and so on. We go follow the same path as we followed for a single species. And let's go to South Africa and Northwest Province. I'm just going to open it in a new tab. Now, what did happen while it's loading there is that you'll see when you log in, it brings up these favorite groups, favorite pentads and favorite species. And what we are now going to do is to create a favorite group. We're going to create a group of pentads. We're going to give it a name. And then whenever you click on this name, it will open that group. Um, that group combination of pentads that we're going to create, it will add it here. And if you click on it, it will provide you with a list and details of that specific group um, as the data is at that specific time. If we go to the Northwest Pentad, and while it's still loading, just to explain to you that that favorite group that we're going to create will be updated with the newest data all the time. So if somebody has submitted data for that list, then, and you load that um, list, it will actually show that new data in the map. So that's really cool that you can get all the newest data. So there's Pilansburg. So we want a list of all the Pentads um, covering the Pilansburg area to get a more comprehensive list of the species in, in that specific um, park. So in this case, we go to create new group on the right-hand side. So you see it removes the um, pentad grid. You can bring it back by say show coverage or clicking here on the right and say high coverage. Now if you click on the map, it will bring up this little red block with these handles, these white things we call handles, and you can drag them. If we zoom in, we can drag these handles that they cover the wall of Pilansburg. You can add handles by, or not add, but as you drag them, they create new little um, icons. And you might have to scroll down to get hold of this one here at the bottom. And if we now show coverage, you'll see that it will get a list of all those pentads. Now, for instance, I'm not interested in having that one, so I'm just going to move that point a little bit. I don't want that pentad. Going to move that point a bit. Um, yeah, maybe not even that one for, um, it's not really within the park. Or maybe that one, yeah, I'm not going to. But it, you can choose, you, you get the idea. So what you then do at the right is to, um, add the pentad name there. I'm just going to call it Pilansburg. And you say save. And what it will do now is to take all the data in that pentad and combine it for you into one list under the name of Pilansburg. 
Now, please note, the more pen tags you're going to select, the longer it is going to take to create the list of pen tags. So maybe don't go and select the whole of South Africa. It's not going to work. It will only work for smaller areas. But in this case, you've now seen it create a coverage summary for Bilansburg. It only selected the pen tags for a half. And if you now go down, you actually get a species list just for Bilansburg. And just with pen tags, it's the same sort of table. If you now click on rep um, reporting rate, you can get the reporting rate, not only for that one pen tag, but for the combined list of pen tags. So this is now actually an accurate species list for all the, the pen tags, uh, for all the species that uh, uh, for the Pilansburg Nature Reserve. And if we scroll down, we can see that 389 species have been recorded in the pen tag, but a lot of them have only been seen once or twice, so they've got very low reporting rates. So if we say you use a cutoff of, let's say, 10%, then 136 species have been seen there on a regular basis. And I think that's quite accurate. When you go and visit um, Pilansburg, you, you can get a, a good hundred species on a day or over a weekend. Um, so that is actually quite accurate. And that is how you get a list for a wall painter. Now that you save this, if you click on home, and remember you need to be logged in in order to get this list. If you now click on favorite groups, and you go to Pilansburg, it's a list that I've just created, and you click on it, it will now upload that list that you've created. And there we are, at the same map that we were previously, species. By the way, if you want to delete um, the Pilansburg map, you can just say here, delete group, and it will then say to you, do you want to delete group? And if you say, okay, it will then delete that group and it will not be available on your home page anymore. So if you click on, you'll see Pilansburg have now been removed. So if you want, you can add and remove groups um, like that. There are also some advanced users of Sabbath 2 data. And I'm not going to discuss this in much detail. So really for people, this, this data downloads are really for people that want to play extensively with the data, um, even for environment impact assessment specialists, for academics, but even as a birder, if you want to play a little bit around with the data, you can download the data, you can um, in import it into Microsoft itself, for example, make your checklist there, um, you can create your own maps, um, there's really, really lots of information, things that you can do with the data. For instance, on the left, that blue block is a, a list that I've created in Microsoft Excel using reporting rate. I've downloaded the data, imported into Microsoft Excel, got rid of some of the columns, um, changed the formatting, and then sorted it according to reporting rate. And there I've got a very informal checklist. On the top right, if you've got a program like QGIS, which is a free um, GIS software, you can actually download the data in shapefile format and then create your own maps and play around with the data. So that is really, really for people that uh, wants to, to learn about GIS and how to use the data, um, that the tool is there. And as I say, this is again something that maybe for for high school students or for university students, it's, it's a nice project to ask them to, to go and download the data, learn the software, to change the symbology, play around with reporting rates. It's a really nice way to learn about GIS and mapping. Also on that downloads are the text for the SABAP1 um, project. As I said earlier, we've had the SABAP1 um, project in the 1990s and um, the project results was published in a publication and that PDF of all the species text can also be downloaded um, from that website. That is the end of my presentation. I want to thank you for um, spending time with me and um, I hope you enjoy this journey through SABAC 2. But above all, I hope that you will use the data. Um, we work really hard to to manage this project. Um, the addresses go to a lot of effort to collect the data. And it really, if it's just lying there and not being used, then it's all, all our effort will be for nothing. So please visit the website, use the data. 
but also if you are not an actress and you have maybe learned something today and you see the value of the project, maybe consider becoming an Atlas. -er. Go and watch that videos that I talked about earlier. Download the app and go Atlasing. And if you need help, um, please contact us and we will try and help you. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Ernst. It is so amazing to see what a phenomenal resource the SABAP project has become, uh, not just for um, us in conservation, but also for all bird watchers. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and skills with us tonight, Ernst. Before we move on to questions, I just wanna remind everyone that as you exit the webinar, you'll be directed to a short three minute survey. Please don't forget that you can also enter our Jakarta Media Monthly Giveaway Competition or the Bird Life South Africa Jackpot Birding and Conservation League Donor Competitions. All of the information for that is on our website. Now, questions can be typed up into the Q&A box, and I see a number of you have already sent in your submissions. Um, we'll get to those in a moment. Please remember that you can upvote your favorite questions. Next week's webinar is an exciting talk on a new and innovative conservation collaboration between Wilderness Foundation Africa, the Angula Partnership, Conservation Outcomes, as well as BirdLife South Africa. Ilani van Veek will co-present with Kishalen Chetty and Steve McKean on a novel conservation finance mechanism, which is offering landowners who declare their properties for conservation a tax incentive. This promises to be a fascinating webinar and one that will teach you a bit about some of the less well-known conservation work going on in our grassland biome. And I encourage everybody to tune in for that talk next week. It's something a little bit different, but really innovative and novel. So please do tune in next week. Now let's move on to some of these burning questions. And I'm going to start off with Mike Lovell's question. And he's asked, um, I've not used Bird Lasso or SABAP2 yet. Is it possible to practice using the Bird Lasso app without corrupting live SABAP2 data? Over to you, Ernst. Yes, Mike, absolutely. So what we need to understand is that Bird Lasso and SABAP2 is two different total entities. Bird Lasso is just an app where you lock your data and you need to submit your data to SABAP2 from Bird Lasso. So you can play around lock data in Bird Lasso and if you don't submit that data to SABAP2, it is actually not a problem. The, the, the data won't be interfering with each other. So we always ask people that want to participate in a project and maybe not use the Bird Lasso is to first download the app, learn how to lock birds, play around with it for a week or two till you're very confident and then enable the atlasing mode in the app start locking birds till you're 100% sure that you understand the, the Atlas protocol and how to lock the data. And then maybe as a first card, submit it as an ad hoc card so that you can understand the submission process. And if you're then happy and you're confident, then you can submit full protocol cards. So please um, go and download the, uh, the BirdLess app, play around with it. Uh, there's lots of other things you can do with the app, um, play, you know, join challenges and and lock your own life list and so on. So, so please download the app and play around with it. And then when you're confident enough, you can start submitting your data to SABAP2. And as I said, there's a vetting process in the background. So don't worry too much. If you make an error, then hopefully the vetting process will catch the error. Um, you will get an email and it will tell you that. And in that process, we also all learn. Um, I sometimes make mistakes and I get an error message or an ORF or we just maybe have identified the bird incorrectly and that is so nice for the vetting system. But through that, we also learn about birds and the identification. Thanks, Ernst. Our next one is from B Brian Funderbolt, and he's asking what the actual requirements before a card is considered to be a full protocol card are. If you wouldn't mind just running through those for us, please. Brian, you saw, you're an old actress, so you should know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, as I explained earlier, so the basic requirement is at least full um, two hours of active atlasing. Now, the important thing there is that it doesn't need to be continuous. So you can, for instance, let's say you drive to a, a place where you're going to stay for a weekend. You arrive there Friday night. You can do an hour of atlasing, park the um, app, the cart in the app, and then on Sunday, Saturday morning, continue with your cart. But the thing is that you need to um, really um, active actors for at least two hours to a maximum of five days. That is the basic requirement. So what we always also ask actors is, is try and visit as much of the pen pad as possible. 
and especially as many of the habitats in the pen pad as possible. As I explained in my talk, when you want to get a really good list of birds in a pen pad, it's important to visit all habitats. We know that certain birds only use water, some forests, some grasslands, and we get the house sparrow at the garage. So if you want to get all those species on your list, you need to visit all those um, habitats within a pen pad in order to get a comprehensive list. But we also know there are realities that we don't always have access to the wild pen pad. It might be private properties or not a lot of roads running through the pen pad. So the protocol asks you to attempt to reach all the habitats within the pen pad, but we do understand that it's not always possible. So that's the basic requirements. Two hours minimum of atlasing and trying to scatter as much as possible of, of the, the pen pad. The other things that I said, then you need to record the birds, birds in the order that you see them. You do not need to count them. Um, you also lock them just once. So if you see a dark Google 20 times, you just lock the first bird. And um, you order the, and then you need to count how many species you've seen in the first hour and how many species you've seen by the second hour, third hour, and so on. And that is basically how easy it is. Um, so you just go out, start logging birds on the app. It will keep track of the time, the order. Just drive around in the, in the pen pad. You can actually follow your movements on the app, uh, on the map, um, lock the birds for two hours, and then you can submit your card as a full protocol atlas card. Thanks, Ernst. Eleanor Mary is asking a question about whether the winter records, so the places where birds go during our winter, for example, the woodland king kingfisher, are there records recorded in other parts of Africa um, suggesting that atlases north of our border are potentially picking up where those birds are? And this can we get access to that series of maps? Sorry, Ernst. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the exciting thing for me of the bird map project, the fact that we're collecting data for the whole of Africa. So we can get the same sort of graphs and data for like project in Kenya, it's a very active um, project. Um, so we can actually, if we take all the data, we can basically see how we can kingfisher leave our country, how they move past um, Zimbabwe, for instance, and then up to Africa by just checking the reporting rates. The problem is at this point in time, we don't get enough data, I think, to really do that analysis in detail. And that is why we are so keen to, to promote um, the project in the rest of Africa that we um, can get this sort of data. But yes, there is this exciting possibility that intra africa migrants, we can get absolutely fantastic data to see when they leave our country, when they arrive in Central North Africa, and when they come back and explore. So, so that is really, really nice. Fantastic. Then Scott's asking, how do you account for the likely increase in bird sightings based on typical holiday seasons? He's saying surely this might skew the data to look like a bird or birds are more present during times when people have more time to bird, such as the school holidays. So yes, that is a potential problem and that is why one of the aims of the Atlas project is not only to get good coverage for the country, but also throughout the year to get good coverage. So one of the things we ask ITLSS is to, for a pen pad, um, to check whether there's, for instance, list in winter, in summer, um, in autumn. Um, so it is it's really important for us to get as much data throughout the year as possible. But because we use protocol um, 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 reporting rates, it sort of average out the data. So it is not too serious a problem but we need to be aware of these sort of issues and the, the people that really dig into the data and analyze these decisions, that's much more clever than me, they know how to, to, um, to cater for these sort of um, potential problems and they will consider that. But as I said, part of the challenge of the project is to also get data for all the months um, for a specific pen pad. Absolutely, and that feeds into a nice question from David Scheibe who's asking, um, how do we account for increased frequency where birders visit certain places more often than others? And I suppose what you've just said regarding the timing would also be catered for with that location data, Ernst. Absolutely. So, um, so this is one of the big challenges that we have. If you look at the coverage map of South Africa of the project, you'll see there's a lot of pentas with only one card. And that is actually not enough to get a decent species list for a pentad. We believe that we need at least four cards for pentad in order to get sort of a base map of a base list of species. 
And then from seven cards and upwards, we are quite confident about the list of species that's in there. And again, there's a lot of factors that can influence this. So for instance, seven cards could be all in winter and then we won't get the summer species, et cetera. So um, these are the sort of challenges that we would have to, to work in uh, through the project is to also try and get coverage throughout the country. And um, so certain areas in the country does have lots of data and that's really valuable for there's lots of analysis that they can do with that data that we maybe can't do in other parts of the country. So there's nothing like too much data, um, so, but we need to get um, coverage, better coverage for the rest of the country. And that is why we need more and more atlases to help us to do this. Um, to do this. Certainly, uh, we, we encourage all of you to go out there and contribute to this important project. Now, Rilof's asking whether you can slice the data using the interface by months, for example. So could he take the last three years for just June, July and August using the reporting list? Would you be able to do that on the website itself, or would that need sort of external processing? Yeah, unfortunately not um, at this moment. If you download the data, you remember at the uh, end of the talk, I said that you can download the data in Excel format. And I just quickly have to think, but they do indicate the, um, the reporting rate in each month um, in the pen tag for that species. So I think if you use that data and you play around with Excel, you will be able to do that sort of analysis. Um, but I'll have to check, but I think it would be possible to do it with the Microsoft Excel data or the data that you can download. Absolutely. Elton Bartlett's asking, there's a number next to some of the birds' names when you're searching for them on the SAVAP2 website. Could you elaborate a little bit on that number, please, Ernst? Yeah, that's just a species number that uh, Michael Brooks um, have assigned to each species. So computer programs like to use numbers. So that's not linked, if I remember correctly, to any Roberts number or any number in any bird book. It is just a number that Michael Brooks have assigned um, to each species. So that's important to know for, for example, when you want to change um, a species on your Atlas card, you need to know that number and so on. But as I said, that is just a number that Michael Brooks have assigned to each species. Great, then Vikas is asking, is there any process in place to guard against incorrect identifications? And I know you've elaborated to some of the vetting committees earlier, Ernst. Um, can you just elaborate a little bit more on these um, vetting committees and how they work? And so that someone who's not necessarily the most proficient birder can start learning when they're putting birds in the wrong space. Yes. So what happens if you submit a sub up to card, the data are compared against current accepted sub up one or uh, sub up two data if there's no data for that species in that pen tag for sub up two it is vetted against sub up one data and then also against other data sources so when the program found that you've seen a species that have never been recorded before in that pen tag it will then generate an out of range form now it's a little bit more complicated than that but that's the basic principle so if you record a species that's totally out of range you've made an error, maybe a finger error or a wrong ID, then you will get such an out of range form. Now what you then need to do is to let the regional atlas committee, and there's each one, there's, there's a committee in each province or some in two provinces, you submit that form to the regional atlas committee and tell them, sorry, I've made a mistake. Um, they must please reject the record or change it. In fact, you now can go yourself on the website, on your data and actually make that change. So if you can then delete the species or change the species to the correct one. So in the beginning, people got very angry when they received these out of range forms for, you know, for, for, for miners, for instance, people got records where miners have been for years and people can't understand why that they get an out of range form for the species. But the sub up two database, the database in, in Cape Town didn't know that a minor occur at that specific place. It was only reported last in Sabre 1, which is a long time ago. So the, the vetting system is not a criticism of your birding abilities. It's actually, if you see a new species today in a pen tag, it's actually something really special for you would be having seen the first person to see that bird. And all that we then ask is to go through a vetting process to submit your record, explain to them what you've seen. If you've got a photograph of the bird or even a recording of the call, you can submit it to the committee and then they will decide whether they accept or decline your record. 
And they will also never just decline if they might come back to you and say, can you please provide us with more information about this? Or did you consider this or this species? And this is where the educational aspect of vetting came in. And the rats are so great in that, that, um, you know, sometimes we are, so let's say, how 10 birders will go to cages in and we will think, oh, species X and Y, Z is the same one as in how 10, and we tick it. And then we later we realize that species maybe doesn't occur there or it looks similar to something else. And then because they're the experts in that area, they can help you and say, look, didn't you, did you consider species X and Y? And in that way, you also learn um, how to better identify birds and so on. I've myself learned that lesson a few times with immature birds, for instance, which I didn't consider when visiting other parts of the country. So, so that can be a, a really great way to, to, to learn about birds. So vetting system in our race must never be seen as a criticism. It's a way to um, make sure that the data is accurate and um, to help us to, 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 to vet and to, to make sure that the data are, are accurate in some sense. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Ernst. We've got a question on Facebook from Jeffrey asking whether you could just elaborate on what the value of ad hoc cards are to the project. It's interesting. We had today a little bit of a discussion between some of the sub to steering committee members about this. Um, ad hoc cards in certain parts of the country especially can be really, really valuable. If you look at the distribution map or the coverage map, you will see that this, if for instance, in the Northern Cape, we've got lots of pen tags where we don't have any data. In the Sutu Swaziland, there's a lot of areas in the country where we don't have a lot of data. So if you drive through the Northern Cape and you see some interesting birds, it would be really valuable for you to submit that data. For your record might be the only record for that specific pen tags. So when we draw, draw the distribution maps, then that record, record will actually show on that specific map. A friend of mine recently, for instance, saw a great striped swallow just two weeks ago in Gauteng, and he submitted that record as an ad hoc record. It's really important for great striped swallows should not be here anymore, so it's a really interesting record. So ad hoc, ad hoc records can play a really, really valuable role, and uh, we ask Atlases to submit it, but the first prize is still a full protocol card. If we can get lots of you travel through the Northern Cape and you can submit full protocol cards for those pen tags without any data, that would be gold, that would be so fantastic. But as I said, if you can't spend two hours and you've seen some interesting birds, just submit it as ad hoc cards, it's really, really important data. Absolutely, as you said, all data is important. So Absolutely. we do encourage everybody to send through those incidental and ad hoc cards. Now, Michael Potts is asking, does all of this work with, when you bird in places with no signal. So I suppose this he's referring to things like bird lasso. Can you just elaborate on that please Ernst? Yes. So bird lasso doesn't require internet access to lock data. So it can use the um, GPS satellite network to um, obtain your position. So if you go out, you can actually take out your SIM card if you wish. You can switch off your data if you're worried that um, it will use data while you're traveling around. Um, you can lock the data anywhere in the country. It will get the location. It might struggle a little bit more because it must sync with the GPS network and use a bit more battery power, but it will be able to get your location and you will be able to lock your birds. When you're then back home or you are in the area with internet access, then you can submit your data to SABAP2. So in that case, um, you know, if you're in an area like in the Northern Cape or even the rest of Africa, where there's no data, lock your data. Um, and then whenever you're back at home and you can sit in your desk, and connect to the Wi-Fi network, wherever, and then go through your cards systematically and submit them. So there's also no time limit after, you know, you can submit, your data a month or two or three months after you've locked the data. It's not an issue. We, we usually ask that you do it as soon as possible for if you get an out of range form that you can still remember where and when you've seen that bird. Um, but yeah, so, so that is absolutely no problem. Thanks, Ernst. Letitia Steinberg, who's one of our avid supporters of our secretary bird work, nice to have you with us, Letitia, is asking, how can data from Bird Lasser be imported into the SABAP2 database using the iOS or Apple software? The webinar on the SABAP2 website is Android-based. Uh, so Bird Lasser is also available for iPhones and so on, so it is not a problem. 
Um, so you can download, it's, it's available and Android and iPhone versions, so you can download it for both. Um, the screens and so on looks a bit different, but the, the maps and the way that you log the data is basically the same. The submission process is also a bit different, but the principle is exactly the same. I hope I understand correct, the, the question correctly, but you can basically um, submit data through both phones, so that is not a problem. Thanks, Ernst. Now, I'm not sure if you're going to be able to answer this one, but hopefully you can. Um, Tadeo from Uganda is asking, how are you ensuring cybersecurity for the SAVAP platform? <laughs> He's just imagining if we had a security breach and lost those over 18 million records. Yes. So that is where Michael Bruce came in. Um, he told me that he makes about three bags of the data on a regular daily basis. So, um, yeah, so this, the, the service is based at the University of Cape Town. They are secure. And Michael ensures that all regular backups are done. I know that he've had various attempts of people to hack the data, and um, they've never managed to do that. So, and even if they do manage, then he does have backups. For instance, about three weeks ago, um, the server crashed, um, the motherboard um, was no more, and Michael managed to get the new webs of the new server up and running within two or three hours, and um, and all the data were uploaded and so on. So, so we've got confidence that the, the data are secure. As you say, and as I said earlier, those data is actually millions of rand worth, so we need to ensure that they are um, properly curated and, and stored. Absolutely, and it's great to hear that those security measures are in place. So thank you to Michael for ensuring that the data is safe and secure. Uh, Dani is asking if there's a time limit in which you need to submit your cards. Yes, so no time limit. Um, as I said earlier, it, it would be nice if you can do it as early as possible for if you get an out of range form um, that you can still remember where you've seen the species and what, what happened during that time. But we get people that you sometimes forgot they submitted a card um, that they've at least two or three years ago, and then you can submit the data. So there's no, no problem. Also for ad hoc cards, if you're now new to atlasing, but you've maybe keep written cards or written lists, you can actually submit that data now. Maybe not as full protocol cards because you did not keep to the full protocol um, protocol, but you can submit that cards as ad hoc cards and then enter it on the website, for example. Um, so I don't think I've mentioned that actually that you can also submit your data through the SAVAP website. Um, so actually, so if you have historical records that you think is of really great value, uh, maybe not before 2007, but from 2007 onwards, you can actually submit that. So, so there's no time limit. Thanks, Ernst. Now, Helena is asking whether there's a way to check the virgin pentads and how to go about targeting those. Would you mind just elaborating a bit on how birders can go and find those lesser atlas pentads using the website, please? Yes, great question. So in the presentation, I showed you the coverage maps. So all that you need to do is, let's say you want to go and have holiday as atlases, we plan our holidays actually around version pentads. <laughs> we go and look, where are these areas that we need data and we, we try and go and arrange our holidays there. Um, so you go to the coverage map on the SABAP2 website. Um, let's say you want to go to Northwest, you just download the coverage map for Northwest and all the pen tags that haven't been done will be white blocks. There won't be any colored um, pen tags or any color on those pen tags. So you can actually um, beforehand see exactly where they are and then you can select your place where you're going to stay that they're really near all of those pen tags. And not only version pen tags, but also pen tags that are yellow. In other words, it's only got one card and two cards, the orange ones. They are priority pen tags for us, and we really want to get Atlas to Atlas them. So in that case, um, you can go and look for the yellow pen tags in the area the way you're going, you're to stay, going to stay, and then try and Atlas them for them. Another thing, there was so much to them actually on the website, there's so much more you can do, but you can also create coverage maps per year. So you can actually ask which pen tags have been Atlas in 2020. And currently it looks so bad because of um, the fact that Atlas couldn't go out in 2020. But so uh, you can, for instance, look at pen tags which haven't Atlas in your area in 2020 and then try and submit the list, which is another target of us is to get good coverage throughout the country every year. But that's the best way for us to monitor changes in bird distribution. 
So um, by doing that, um, we can get really accurate data. So just go to the South website, go to the coverage map and play around with the different um, patterns and drop down menus and um, scroll down on the map, zoom in, and you'll be able to see exactly where we need um, to access this to go. Thank you so much, Ernst. I see it has gone 8.30, so I'm gonna do one more question and then I think we'll close up for the night. This one's from Michiel and he's asking, how do you cope with species that have been split or lumped during the course of the SABAP2 lifespan? Yeah, that's a bit of a nightmare for us, but um, so um, what we try, and so let me explain it this way. So we do split those species. So those numbers that you saw or that we talked about earlier, Michael will allocate a new number to the new species. And then we will submit data from there on for the new species. The problem is then that when it comes to vetting, that is vetted to a blank database and that creates all sorts of problems. So where we can, we will still vet the data against the old species data, but that is not always a problem. So um, vetting is uh, of, of, of split species a bit of a problem. And some of the issues that we look at currently in the second tier vetting process is like seven black boron, non black boron, as there were no maps for seven black boron previously, um, the, the data were just not vetted correctly and we are now correcting all of those submissions. So yeah, split species does give us a bit of a headache, but there is a way around it and we do add them um, over time. That's great, Ernst, and it's good to hear that we can adapt to all these taxonomic changes that seem to creep up on us. <laughs> all right, everybody, I think uh, that's all the time we really have time for tonight. I just want to say a massive thank you to Ernst and Andrew for joining us this evening and really Ernst, I've spent a lot of time on that Sabbath website and I even learned a thing or two. So thank you so much for giving up your Tuesday night to share the wonderful tricks of the trade with our old hand atlases and also teaching some of the new hands about this wonderful project. And I hope that everyone will head out and do some birding and atlasing around their home pentads as well as on some of their travel journeys when we are eventually allowed out. So thank you very much, Ernst. I'd like to say good night to everyone. Keep safe out there. Keep your eyes on the skies and outside. Keep enjoying those birds. And I'll see you all here next week again, seven o'clock, same time, same place. Take care, everybody. Good night. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>